news Jesus saves Spread the tidings all around Jesus saves, Jesus saves Bear the news to every land Climb the steeps and cross the waves Onward tis our Lord's command Jesus saves, Jesus saves Wafted on the rolling tide Jesus saves, Jesus saves Tell to sinners far and wide Jesus saves, Jesus saves Sing ye islands of the sea Echo back ye ocean caves Earth shall keep her jubilee Jesus saves, Jesus saves Give the winds a mighty voice Jesus saves, Jesus saves Let the nations now rejoice Jesus saves, Jesus saves Shout salvation full and free Highest hills and deepest caves This our song of victory Jesus saves, Jesus saves When I think I'm going under Part the waters, Lord When I feel the waves around me Calm the sea When I cry for help Oh, hear me, Lord And hold out your hand Touch my life Still the raging storm in me like thine can peace afford I need thee oh I need thee every hour I need thee oh bless me now my Savior I come to my 
my soul. It is well, it is well with my soul. Though Satan should buffet, though trial should come, let this blessed assurance control. That Christ has regarded my helpless estate And hath shed his own blood for my soul It is well with my soul It is well, it is well And Lord, haste the day when the faith shall be sight, the clouds be rolled back as a scroll, the trump shall resound, and the Lord shall descend, even so. It is well with my soul, it is well with my soul, it is well, it is well with my soul. For what earthly reason would the heavenly Father send down His Son to suffer rejection and pay for crimes He had not done? For what earthly reason would the Father let him hang on a tree? I wept with the answer That one earthly reason was me I was the reason That one earthly earthly reason I was the guilty He was the sacrifice I was the taker He was the giver dying while I go free that one earthly reason was me the fairest of angels was not summoned from the throne up on high to purchase my pardon not even the angels could die the only provision for my freedom was destined to be the sweet Lamb of glory And His only reason was me I was the reason That one earthly reason I was the guilty 
He was the sacrifice. I was the taker. And he was the giver. Dying while I go free. That one earthly reason was me. That one earthly reason and his only reason was me. Turn in your Bibles to John chapter 15, please. We live in a troubled world, no question about it. We see the coronavirus pandemic. Uh, because it's worldwide and hopes of trying to curb it, governments of this world have put new restraints on the citizens uh, and they sometimes are uncomfortable. We have rioting, we have looting, which of course results in lawlessness across America. The economy is being hurt as businesses are only allowed to work at half capacity. People are frustrated, they're discouraged by uh, many baseless rules even being placed upon people today. And as a result, the joy and happiness that used to be obvious in a person's life isn't there. You don't see uh, that excitement about living, uh, the joy of life. Matter of fact, uh, even when you're not even allowed to go to church, just because somebody says you shouldn't be allowed to. I think churches are opening up. In some states, they're not even open yet. And yet you can go out and buy an ice cream cone. <laughs> Some of the rules don't make sense. I think this is a great time to realize and understand that joy does not depend upon outward circumstances. And that's what this verse has to say in John chapter 15, verse 11. Jesus himself is making this statement. He says, these things have I spoken unto you that my joy might remain in you and that your joy might be full. John 15, 11. So Jesus is talking to people about an internal substance and he calls it joy. And he says it's from him. He wants his joy to be in people. And if it is, then your joy should be full. And I want to talk to you about how do you achieve that today. How can we have joy in the midst of all the problems and the ugliness that we see on television, seemingly hatred? Matter of fact, I don't even like to watch much of that TV anymore. Uh, I get no joy out of seeing violence and hatred and beatings and, and all of that. And yet it's reality, and it goes on. It certainly doesn't do a thing to make your life exciting. But I'm here to tell you that in spite of our circumstances, you and I can be filled with joy even in our, in our present circumstances. Heavenly Father, encourage our hearts today from your word. Help us to realize that this world cannot defeat us. Only if we let it. And so, Father, Jesus had come to bring joy to his children, and he wants that joy to be full. And so, Father, I pray that we can walk out of here today with fullness of joy, looking at the world through a different prism, uh, that we see Jesus, we see his power, we see God the Father able to do all things. And, Father, we might even be excited about the future. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. 
Notice what Jesus says about the source of a person's joy. He says that my joy might remain in you and that your joy might be full. All right, I want that joy. I want Jesus' joy. He, he doesn't, wasn't concerned about the Roman culture around him at the time, the, the Caesars or whoever, Pilate. All these things, it wasn't comfortable conditions under which he lived. And yet, he didn't, it didn't seem like the political atmosphere bothered him that much. He just went about life. He continued to do what he did. And whatever came his way, he dealt with it. In other words, the circumstances was not going to disrupt his joy that he had about living and ministering. So how do we arrive at the source of this joy? I believe it's contained right here. Let's look at it very quickly. It begins with a life focused upon Jesus Christ. Verse 7. Notice how it says, if you abide in me. That's the way it starts out. Jesus starts right out by telling us the source of our joy. If I, if you abide in Christ. He says, my words abide in you and so on. Now abide means to remain or continue. In other words, he's saying that this relationship that you, with you have with Christ cannot be superficial. If he really abides with you, if you really love him, if you're really surrendered to him. Every time I think of sincerity with the Lord Jesus Christ, I always think of this parable because there are a lot of people who say they love Jesus, but they don't know, they think they love him. Well, the parable explains it. A beautiful princess was walking down a country lane. And a very handsome prince dressed in royal, royal apparel came up behind her, dropped on his knees and proposed marriage. Looking up into her eyes, he said, If only I could have thee, I would never want another. <laughs> How charming. Will you give me your hand in marriage, he asked. She looked at the prince and replied, down the road, about a mile, my sister is following. She is far more beautiful than I. Go look at her. And if after having seen her, you still desire me, I'll give you my answer. The very handsome prince got up, ran down the road. About an hour, he came back running to her. With a look of great disappointment on his face, he said to the beautiful princess, why did you tell me that your sister was more beautiful than you? Why, she's not to be compared with you in beauty. The princess replied, But didn't you say that if only you could have me, you would never want another? If that was true, why did you even bother to go look at my sister? Isn't that powerful? Isn't that powerful? He thought he wanted her. He thought she was the most beautiful until there might be someone else more beautiful. Well, I'll check her out, and then I'll come back. A lot of people approach Jesus Christ the same way. I'll try Jesus until I find something I like better. That doesn't work, my friend. You either fall in love with Christ or you don't. And that's why you see a lot of superficial Christianity today. Oh, I love Jesus, until there's a religion of the world or a God of this world that they love far more, where they will worship that God on Sunday rather than the true God on Sunday. Oh, there's all kinds of gods out there that people say, I love, I love you, God, I love Jesus, but <laughs> wow, this one's pretty attractive over here. And I think maybe, maybe I'll choose that one. Jesus says, if you abide with me, if you continue, in other words, if what you have is really real, if you really love me, I'm going to tell you how to have joy. And it starts with him. There has to be a salvation experience. There has to be a point in your life and my life 
when I realize I'm a sinner, I'm sorry for it, I repent of it, I don't want that lifestyle anymore, I want to follow Christ, I want his righteousness, I love him for what he did upon Calvary, as Tom sang about. And Lord, I love you because you first loved me. It starts with giving our lives to the Lord Jesus Christ. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Acts 2.21, and it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. There has to be that initial reception of Jesus Christ. My question is, do you remember when you cried out in mercy to be saved and forgiven of your sins? Do you remember how humble you felt when you realized that Jesus Christ died on Calvary's cross for you? He went through the agony and the suffering for you. I hope that you can refer back to that in your mind. I know, as, and you may be as me, the, the joy that flooded my soul when I surrendered my life to Christ and I asked Christ to come in and save me and forgive me and cleanse me of my sin. How wonderful that was. The joy that flooded my soul. The peace that it brought. Do you remember that? He says, if you abide in me, it means that you continue to surrender your will to his leadership as he seeks to direct your steps on a daily basis. It means that we allow Jesus to live his life through us as the Holy Spirit guides and directs our steps on a daily basis. Do you allow him to do that? Is God actually directing your steps each and every day? You're following his leadership. Do you seek that in your life? Matter of fact, that's what it really means to be filled with the Spirit, that, that you give more and more of your life to the Holy Spirit. You're saying, Holy Spirit of God, take, take center stage in my life. Guide and direct in every aspect of my life. Fill me with the fruit of the Spirit, the love, the joy, the peace, the long-suffering, the faith, the meekness, and so on. God, all of those things I want to be incorporated in my life. When you're saved and walking in the Spirit, in the Spirit, your joy will be the same joy that Jesus experienced each and every day of his life. He says that my joy might remain in you and that your joy might be full. So it starts with the Lord Jesus Christ. Secondly, it's a life founded upon God's Word. Notice verse 7. And my words abide in you. He's saying, here's how it's done. Here's the simple principles laid out right before you. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you. In other words, God's word abiding in you will accomplish the following. It'll keep your focus upon spiritual things rather than the temporal. That's interesting. Because we're so human. Our tendency is just to deal with the temporal all the time. Now, we need temporal things in this life. No question about it. We need food. We need shelter, a job. We need money to, to buy things, friends, doctors, clothing, stores, a car. And we could go down the list of temporal things that keep us going in life. But the problem is, is these are not the things that bring joy to our lives. Because every one of these things can fail us and bring us heartache. And most of the time they have. Whether it's your car, whether it's your job, whether it's a friend. All of these things that we need that are temporal have the capacity to bring heartache to our lives. That's why they cannot be the source of our joy. There has to be something greater, and that is found in the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, Jesus and the things eternal, such as the fruit of the Spirit, which we mentioned, only grow in value, and one day those eternal qualities, and through those we will be rewarded handsomely in heaven. Romans 8, 5 says, For they are of the flesh, do mind the things of the flesh, but they 
that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. 2 Corinthians 4.18, While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things, se for the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. You see, the Word of God is eternal. That's what's important about it. It's never going to pass away. God wrote it and it, and it settled it. And it's always going to be. Why? Jesus is the Word. He is eternal. And so is the Word of God. I'm, I thank God for the Bible. I really do. Uh, you know, it allows us to know what's good and what's bad. What's right and what's wrong. What pleases God and what doesn't please God. And so often people just come up with this stuff in their own minds. I think this is okay. Well, what makes it okay just because you think it's okay? Or if I think it's okay. Who sets the standard for what's right and what's wrong? It's not our government. Abortion's fine. No, it's not. And you can go down the list of things that the government comes along and says is fine. No, it's not. If it does not line up with the Word of God, it's not right. I don't care who says it's right. See, I'm, you ought to be thankful every day that you have the Bible in your hand and you can look at it because God is the one who determines right and wrong, not man. Man is sinful. We just sent a spaceship up, Spaceship X or whatever. They want to go to the moon. They're going to set up a colony on the moon. They were going to, the, they were going to go to Mars and set up a colony on the Mars. You know who's going to run those colonies? Sinful people. And they're going to make sinful rules. And they're going to put themselves as the power structure. That's what sinful people do. It's crazy. Oh, we've got to escape this terrible world we live in. No, you're just going to take it to another planet. It's wild. The only way it's going to be solved is when Jesus Christ comes back, the Prince of Peace, he'll show you how to run a world. He'll run it in righteousness and justice, he says. Isn't that wonderful? If you're a child of God, you're on the winning team. Matter of fact, that ought to just make your joy full because this is not the end. It's just going to get better for the child of God. Remember, the Bible will keep you from sin or sin will keep you from the Bible, won't it? Great saying. The reason many don't know what sin is is because they simply don't know what the Bible says. If you don't ever read your Bible, how in the world would the person know what sin is? And so everybody operates, well, at the book, end of the book of Judges, it says, every man did that which was right in their own eyes. That is a formula for anarchy. Everybody doing whatever's right in their own eyes. I think I should be able to come in your house and take whatever you have because I think I should have it. And that makes sense to me. But it's wrong. I think I'll just go over here to Gucci's and just take it because I, I just feel like it belongs to me. I've been cheated all my life. That's bad. That's wrong. Shouldn't even need a Bible to tell you that. We just know it's wrong when you steal from other people. We cannot make our own decisions. And that's why the problem is that when we start straying from the Word of God, people make faulty decisions. You see, if your joy is going to be full, it's going to be full because you have a life founded upon the Word of God. You see, God does not lie. He's, he's just and right in all that he does. Titus 1-2 says, in hope of eternal life, which God, they cannot lie, promised before the world began. So in following God's word, 
joy of heart is sure to follow because what you, you're following the Bible and it makes you excited and thrilled because you're reading truth. You know that God wrote the book and he's honored when you keep the book. And it can make, you, you're thrilled at the close of the day and say, God, I tried to honor you the very best that I could. As I read the scriptures and as I followed the Holy Spirit, I tried to honor you with my life, and you feel good about that, regardless of what's going on around you. Thirdly, a third way to have fullness of joy is found right here, verse 7. You shall ask what you will, and it shall be done unto you. It's a life of faithful prayer. Faithfulness in your prayer life. The Lord, it's interesting, he includes prayer into here in this, in this segment of telling you how to have joy in your life. And, privilege, and prayer is a privilege. Ye shall ask, he says. Ye shall ask. Every child of God that is abiding in Christ and his word enjoys this privilege that God gives us that I can go directly to God and just ask him, Here, God, here's my problem. Here's my need. Here's the trial that I'm going through. And I can share that with him. And, and he's always interested in hearing what his children have to say. Philippians 4, 6 says, be careful for nothing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. God in invites us that in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. He's inviting a phone call. God loves to hear from his children. He wants to hear you bring your burdens and your requests to him. Yes, he knows what you're facing. He knows what you're going through already. But he, my, he loves to hear you. Bring it to him. God, I need you. I need your help. Proverbs 15, 29, the Lord is far from the wicked, but he heareth the prayer of the righteous. How wonderful that is. If you belong to God, God hears your prayer. If you're abiding in Christ, God hears your prayer. Now, again, how he deals with it, is conditional. Now he says here that uh, you ask whatever you will, it shall be done unto you. But that's not a carte blanche, uh, 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 a blank check. In other words, if, what's he say? Whatsoever you ask, uh, ask what you will. When you are abiding in Christ, your will will be the same as God's will for your life. That's why he can say that. Elsewhere in the Bible, when you're not walking in the Spirit and we ask something outside the will of God, he says you've asked in vain to heap it upon your own lusts. You don't get those things. But when you're walking in the will of God and are asking things according to the will of God, God says, I'll give you those things because it fulfills my will for your life. Oh, how he wants us to pray. And I think I, I, I love the fact that there's no prayer too difficult for him to answer or perform. We serve that great of a God. Jeremiah 32, 17. Ah, Lord, behold, thou hast made the heaven and the earth by thy great power and stretched out arm, and there's nothing too hard for thee. Jeremiah understood that. It is wonderful to be able to look to God and say, God, I have this burden. And yet at the same time, God, I don't know how to solve it, but I know that there's nothing too big for you. And you take it to him. And he hears your prayer. There's a couple of conditions that qualify the promise. It says it shall be done unto you. You see, abiding in Christ signifies the maintaining of a heart in communion with Christ. If you're abiding in Christ, your heart is in communion with Christ. Not only must the heart be occupied with Christ, but the life must be regulated 
to Christ through the Scriptures. So if you're seeking the fullness of joy, spend some time in prayer. Give God the glory when he meets your need. We might ask the question today, what is your need? Do you have a need? Is there something you need from God? Is it a selfish need? Or is it a legitimate need? You need to be saved? He'll save you. Behind on the bills? It's a legitimate need. Now, he may direct you a different way of arriving at that. But God is, wants to know your need, and he's there to help you with your need. And it's amazing how God does supply us. Our faith and our expectation needs to be in the Lord. To have fullness of joy requires a life fruitful in service. Notice verse 8. Herein is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit, so shall you be my disciples. He says your fruit, to have joy, will honor and glorify God. Herein is my Father glorified. If you and I are abiding in Christ, what, then what we're doing, we're actually doing the things that Christ would do. We're doing what Christ would do if we're abiding in Christ. Well, what did Christ do? He witnessed. He tried to point people to the kingdom of God. We're a witness for Jesus Christ. So if you want joy, do what Jesus did. So that God will be glorified. Brag on Christ. Point people to Christ. Tell them about what Jesus will do for them. He died on the cross for their sins. Share Christ. Be a witness for Christ. Faithfully attend the worship services. We've seen that repeatedly in the Bible where it says it was a common practice of Jesus on the Sabbath to be in the synagogue. He did it all the time. Now, if we're abiding in Christ, why would we not? If that's what Jesus does, and he delighted to do it, why would we not do it? Jesus had compassion on other people. Sometimes we don't have that kind of compassion. But if you're going to have joy in your life, you'll learn how to have compassion upon people and try to help people who maybe have a greater need that you, than you have. If you're going to have joy in your life, you'll learn how to tithe your income, support missions, give to good Christian causes. If you're going to have joy in your life, you're going to stand on biblical truth. Jesus did. And you're going to be walking in obedience to his word. Everything that Jesus did, he did it according to God's will. He says, I didn't come to do my will, but to do the will of the Father. And everything he, the Bible says everything he said, everything that he did, everything about his life was in exact obedience to what the Father wanted him to do. If that's where his joy came from, we can have that same joy if we do it. It's in, it's in serving. You see, your, your fruit and my fruit will bless others. Notice what it says that you bear much fruit. Let me point out that fruit always blesses somebody. That's what fruit does. It brings a blessing to somebody else. It doesn't just grow and rot. That's not his purpose. His, his purpose is that somebody else will be blessed by it. So the question we have to ask ourselves, in what way does our lives benefit other people? If we're bearing fruit, someone else was blessed by God through you. The question is, who was that person? Who was blessed by your life this week? How many people were blessed by your life this week? Now, we have to ask that. And I'm saying to you, if we get caught up in the temporal and we lose 
lose sight of the eternal, we'll lose the joy that God wants us to, to have. We are to bear fruit. And in so doing, how I speak to you, if I was encouragement to you, I just bore fruit. If I helped you maybe financially, I just bore some fruit. If uh, I did a, ran an errand for you, if I sat and listened to you and gave you my time and just cared for you and was concerned about you, I was bearing fruit because you were blessed by me or another person. The question is, who did we bless this week? Did we bless anybody from a godly standpoint? And those are the questions we have to ask if, if we expect to have great joy and our joy might be full in our lives and you said, wow, what a day I had. I got to witness to so-and-so down the street. I got to take something over to somebody's house. I got to be a blessing to them, and I did this for them, and I got in the Word of God, and I think God was glorified as I read the Bible, and I prayed and talked to the Lord, and I believe it glorified God. I mean, you go on with your life, and it makes you feel good because you're doing what God has asked you to do. As you bear much fruit, your joy will continue to increase. Your fruit will identify with Jesus Christ. He goes ahead and says, so shall ye be my disciples. In other words, the fruit that springs from the fruit of the Spirit at work in your life and my life will identify us as being disciples of Jesus Christ. God will be glorified. You and I will be different people when Jesus is living his life through us, especially as viewed by the world. The world will see us differently. The world doesn't understand forgiving people who have wronged you. They're not used to that. 